Yo, Humpers, get ready, because we got a Guggen, a four-time Emmy Award winner, and a bloody Aussie. It doesn't get any better. I'm stuck. See? Like, you get stuck in a voice, and now it's all confusing, but I hope you watch. I'm Bob Cobb for the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one and welcome all. It is Wednesday, which makes it hump day. And we're back to put a little hump in your hump day. So welcome humpers. My name is Mercer. That is the name of the show. Week after week, I try to give you an awkwardly honest fishing podcast. And I will go on record and say, I think we got a lot closer last week, especially in the awkward department. I mean, an awesome show. And, and the plan is for this show to constantly evolve, constantly change, and constantly be different um, until we figure out exactly what this show is going to be. Um, I mean, it, it, it has been a bit of an evolution. I mean, I used to do this show with another guy. Now I do it by myself, and that's why it's called Mercer, because it's, it, it, it's just me. Um, but um, it's not just me. It's me and you guys, and your feedback, your support has been awesome. I mean, uh, keep all the likes, all the subs, and all the support, all the reviews on on the different um, streaming platforms. I mean, it makes a huge difference, believe it or not. All that stuff makes a giant, giant difference, and uh, and I really, really appreciate the support. Um, week after week, this show's going to always change. Show's always going to be different. Sometimes it'll make you laugh. Sometimes it'll make you cry. Sometimes it'll teach you something. Sometimes it'll get you answers to things. And it, but but always, I hope you leave this show thinking, man, I can't wait till next week's show. So enough of the crap. I mean, you don't want me to sell erect erectile dysfunction pills. I mean, that really, to be honest, we have not made it on this show until we're selling erectile dysfunction pills. But we're going to jump right into our very first cast because week after week, this show is the same. I mean, it, well, it's different, but it's the same. I'm just totally contradicting everything I said the first two minutes. But what I mean by it being the same is basically I just reach into my bulbous Rolodex and I call some people up and this First guest is somebody, I mean, we're starting with a banger. Let's just go on the record and say, dude has almost 2 million YouTube followers. Um, he's one of the most boisterous members of the Guggen squad. And um, this was something we planned several months ago. I mean, me and him had talked about, let's get back together every few months and kind of assess this situation. But a few months ago when Rob Turkula from the Guggen squad, of course, Lunkers TV, Decided to announce that I'm going to fish tournaments. It 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 unearthed so many different emotions in so many different people. Uh, some of it passion. I mean, all of it passionate. Some of it positive. Some of it negative. Some of it love. Some of it hate. Um, I mean, it got this little podcast more traffic than it's ever gotten. So thank you for that. Um, but bottom line, I mean, it was because everybody wanted to push a narrative. If you didn't like the Guggen squad, you had to say, man, they're not, he's not going to catch him. If you did like him, you had to say, wait, we're going to catch him. It, but everybody was pushing a narrative. But bottom line, from the start, I've said the same thing. We should be celebrating this dude and his giant set of balls for just laying it on the line. You know, no, he doesn't lose anything if he doesn't catch him in tournaments. But he also didn't have to do this. But he's incredibly driven, and obviously, this is a dream for him. Just like it's a dream for all of us, every single one of us, whether you're listening to this podcast, whether you're working in the industry, like I'm lucky enough to do, whether you're competing in tournaments, this is a dream. And just because you have 2 million YouTube followers doesn't mean you don't have this dream and it doesn't mean that this dream isn't real to you and if you're willing to work hard enough at it you'll find success and I'm happy to report that Rob has you know four or five I think six events into his tournament career I mean he had some rough ones don't get me wrong I mean exactly what you would expect for a new tournament angler triple digit finish after triple digit finish but I think his fifth or sixth event just recently, the NPFL, he cashed a check for nine grand. 
kudos to Rob for that. I mean, I would say that's saying he is making some inroads and making some headway in his quest to become a professional tournament angler. But it doesn't really matter what I say. It doesn't really matter what you say. That is not what this podcast is about. This podcast is about hearsay no but that's not what this podcast it's it's going right to the horse's mouth so why rather than talking around why don't we just the horse's mouth now that's another one of those statements it's just really dumb right really like that doesn't make anyone feel good i mean rob here and we're going to the horse's mouth at, at no time do you like yes i am said horse and said mouth but before I put my foot in my mouth anymore, let's jump to our very first guest from Lunkers TV, Rob Turkula. Rob Turkula, Lunkers TV, thank you for doing this. Uh, what are you up to today? Absolutely nothing. It is pouring rain and thunderstorms here. So I'm just running errands, editing videos. The last time I talked to you on a Zoom screen, um, I had no idea, number one, the amount of feathers we were going to ruffle but but a lot of them number one thank you for all the people that came but 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 people got 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 riled up and and i don't think that i said anything wrong but but i wanted to get your take on it uh you've been doing this now for what two three three four months this this pro angling yeah, experiment stuff yeah uh, Yeah, I'd call it an experiment pretty much. Next year is going to be even more ruffled the feathers. I can't wait for that one. I just found some news out here a couple of days ago that we haven't even talked about there. The like we're going to take the feathers and just fully ruffle them the opposite way come come 2022. Okay, before we get into 2022, to talk to me about this. What do you think of things so far compared to that day we talked uh, to today? Well, it's much more difficult than people think. Uh Honestly, it really is. It's so much different than just going out and just fishing randomly. The first couple, it took me a little bit to get like my feet, feet like set, I guess. I don't know. It, it was kind of, I was, I was kind of, uh, just so used to just going out, catching fish, making a video and be done. And then not worrying about the changing weather conditions or 200 boats on the water at the same time, fishing for fish at the same time as you. So it kind of, kind of screwed me over, uh, mentally going into day one of every single, the first two events, excuse me, just, just had me so jacked Does that up. shock you? I mean, Florida, I, no, a little bit. I mean, well, not Florida, not so much. Cause I didn't really, I've never fished it when it was below 32 and my first, first tournament, first day one, it was like 28 in the morning and I learned a lot. Probably should have had drop shot tied on in a punch rig. Two totally different sides of the spectrum, but that would have that would have panned a lot better than it did. So. What what does tournament fishing? I mean, I think I'm hearing the answer right here, but 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 does tournament fishing has it forced you to become a better angler? Oh my god, yes! I've learned more in three months than I did in the last six years because I'm forced to fish in situations, do things that I would never ever want to even attempt to do. I, I don't want to go do some of the stuff I'm forced to do, like. Uh, you fall. I don't want to go fishing six inches of water, but I was catching them there. So I was forced to continue to catch fish in six inches of water, but there was guys catching them in 25 foot of water. And I'm, that's not really my, my most enjoyable thing to do, but I know I'm going to have to do that here actually here in a couple of weeks. So your drive to succeed at this, has it grown since you started oh, yeah. or, or, or has it just stayed the same level? Yeah, I know. It's got even, it's got even more, it's got even worse to be honest with you. Cause at the beginning I wasn't, I wasn't catching limits. Now I'm at least I'm catching limits every single day. I've since I left Florida on the, the second Bassmaster open event, I've not had a, not, I haven't had a day without a limit. That's like my number one was always just go get your limit. And then after that, just worry about catching the bigger fish. So that kind of helps me. That's helped me kind of like calm myself come 10 o'clock. I only have four. I'm like, I just need one more. You know, how obsessed have you become with it? Oh, it's crazy. That's the only <laughs> thing I, I, I really do. Like, I'm just, that's the only thing I really care about everything. I'm, I, I'm like the next events on, on a hair's chain. So the only thing I really care about is getting prepped for that one. And then I'm trying to get prepped for the one just after that by getting stuff ready here. So I, so when I come back, I just kind of throw everything in the box and just go. So what's the reception? It's Sorry to interrupt you there, but what's the reception been like from other anglers from the industry? I mean, because like I said at the beginning of this interview, 
there was a lot of people with a lot of things to say, uh, you know, after that interview, just simply because you said you were going to do this. And 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 as I said, then I think uh, kudos is deserved for for taking that, you know, move. You know, I don't think it's a risk with the things that you've experienced in your life, um, your history. But but I it is a risk in the fishing industry. But what has the reaction from other people been like? Well, they, so at the beginning, everybody, I was a huge forum thread. It's so fun. I got sent this one. It was like pages and pages and pages long about how Rob will never even cash a check through an entire year. And we fought, we did, we cashed one this last one. It took me five events to finally start like getting settled, but it was also my type of strong suit fishing. So I wouldn't really, it was, just, it was easy for me to sell in, but uh, from the outside people, like the, the audience, a lot more hate from them, zero hate from any of the pros like zero none i all those guys they talk to me um a lot of them are trying to figure out how to do youtube themselves like really that's true it is a truth so it's weird really good, right now yeah. if you look if you look what's happening <laughs> every single one of them is just trying to do youtube in some sort of sense so i work with them on trying to try to help them with their social media and like hey this is what you need to do this is how we did it this is this is what it is and they help kind of guide me along with uh how not to get so spun out in certain situations. I mean, there's a lot of good guys in my corner. That's most you, I'd said that last time, but it's kind of growing even more now. Like I've, I've gotten a strong relationship with like Brandon Pollock and like random guys that I'd really never talked to before. And I talked to him on daily. I talked to Dustin Connell dinner every day, like every day. So I think it's just, you know, throwing your hat in the ring. You know, a lot of those guys, you know, they respect that. But but I have to ask you, because I know I'm going to see it in the comments, because I, I think one of the biggest things where I said, man, he he's got giant balls for doing this. And somebody was like, how can you say that, a you know, somebody who served their country has giant, but takes nothing to go from that to this. And do is there anything that connects them or the two totally like I mean, when I look at what you've done through your life, I mean, I, I kind of agree with the comment in a way. How can it be nerve wracking? But I watch your footage and I watch how excited you were at that last event when you put that big fish in the boat, and how you're <laughs> shaking. And I'm yeah. like, well, clearly that this gets him jacked. It's a little different than just normal fishing. Like Paul, Nick, he sent me a text like a month ago. He got all it said was, now you see why I get so excited over a two pounder. That was the truth. It was like, there's, it's so different that you, like usually when I go make a fishing video, if I catch a four or lose a four at the boat, it's kind of like, yeah, whatever, just go keep flipping. But when you're on a time limit and your your day is so short and you only have so many opportunities and you miss that at the boat, it's your your adrenaline's pumping like instantly. I almost passed out when I caught that giant this last tournament. I had to like sit down and regroup. So I'm like, oh my god, because I knew if I just caught four the rest of the day or three more the rest of the day, I was going to cast a check because I had pretty good weight and I was just excited. I think this is more like a rush. I just – I never said I was going to be the best angler in the world, the tournament guy, uh, but I would like to be in contention in the top 25 every single tournament is my goal for the next couple of years at least. So this is something you plan to do for the foreseeable oh, yeah, yeah, future. Yeah. This oh, is not yeah. an experiment. This is – No, 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 no. I'm going to keep doing it because I'm learning so much. And it's like I'm going on – the disadvantage I have on these lakes is I've never been to them. And what I'm learning is when I go and fish the opens – or any of these other tournaments like that, these guys either live there or they yeah. fished it for the last 10 years. So they are like, well, I don't, I don't need to go North cause I don't like it. Well, I get to Douglas and I'm like, well, I don't know where the hell to even go. So I start in the South and I catch a couple of fish. I never run North. Well, now looking back for next year, if I ever have to go there, I'll never go South. I'll just go North. So it's kind of like I, this year and the next year, I'm probably going to have to just learn a ton of lakes that I never been on in my entire life. It, and it also it makes it, it makes the the angling experience almost last longer. Weirdly enough, oh, I explained yeah. to people because that trip to Douglas in the past was that was a trip to Douglas where you might have gone and shot a video or whatever. And maybe you'll go back there. Maybe you won't. You'll probably go back there if it was good on the exact same type of conditions. But yeah. but now when you leave Douglas, you're like, man, I don't know what it's going to be like next time. And you, you literally start cataloging all the lakes. It's amazing how it makes I think tournament fishing, I think there's some incredible anglers that will never fish a tournament in their life. But I think that every right. angler that does choose to fish tournaments and commits to it probably ends up a better angler when they're done. Oh, 100%. A lot of, so 
a lot of the guys, there's a lot of YouTubers that will never fish tournaments like ever because they're kind of scared of crushing their, their egos that will get crushed or they'll, they don't want their audience to see them do terribly. So they're like, ah, oh, they may not watch my views if I do terrible, which is our videos if they do terrible, which is very true. And, but you also have like the local stick who's kind of scared to put his money up to go out there and really do it. It's kind of a, I don't know. It kind of takes, you have to have like a gambling personality, I think to almost be able to say, you know what, screw it. Let's go try this random lake. And you have to put $1,800 up to go test. It's literally you're just testing the waters and just gambling <laughs> if you're going to do well or not. That's all it is. It's so. pretty phenomenal. So outside of being in the top 25 consistently, what, what is success for you in this, in this, because I've also, I'll tell you this about you. You don't small think that's what I'm learning. You do not, you, you don't look at this as you fishing. I'm sure you look at this as a space or words that really successful business people use. What is success for you in this space? Oh uh, man, that's a good one. Um, I guess success at this point is pretty much if I can cast a check every event, that'd be, that was cool for my, myself. Well, from a branding standpoint, it's more about spreading the Guggen logo across the board. That's what it really is about it's spreading the brand. I don't really honestly know how much more the Guggen logo or the brand itself can take up any more peg space in big box. I think we're pretty much tapped out there. I don't know how much bigger we really can get. So now let's just try to change the tournament side of the industry's views on us because a lot of them think that we don't know how to fish. So this is my goal is to show them, hey, look, I'm, I'm going to get my teeth kicked in, but I'm probably going to smash some faces in myself at some point. And that's all I got to do is prove that Guggen can fish at that level. It's a great way to look at it. It's a great way to look at it. So you told me you were going to ruffle some feathers in 2022. Mm. You want to drop some bombs on me right now and ruffle some ah, feathers? I mean, why say. wait? We got today. <laughs> Who needs Why, tomorrow? We, we uh, got tonight, babe. I think my this. I think the guy who own, or runs runs Guggen would be a little salty at me if I did. But I can tell you that we're bringing back the weight series that we did. I know that's going to come back, and it's going to have a specific group of anglers. And I may or may not be a part of that group of anglers during the entire weight series, which means I don't know if I'll fish any opens or Toyota series events. But I'll still be fishing two trails. I'll just, okay. I'll, I'll leave it like that. All right. All right. Well, I'll figure it out. Last thing before you go, I got to ask you because being a YouTube superstar that you are just a hair under 2 million subscribers. So our dozens and dozens of viewers get over there and get him closer. But um, Jake Paul, Logan Paul, the Paul yeah. brothers, are they geniuses? Are they insane? And have you paid attention to any of this? Yeah, well, yeah. So they're the smartest guys on YouTube when it comes to branding and marketing and just making just literally stacks of cash. That's all they care about is making money. That's all this is about. They're generating revenue. I mean, they're not stupid. They're really smart. Now, I, I do know that we have we were discussing something yesterday within our group about doing a – so they're doing the paper boxing thing, and they're really just doing it because you're just riding a train while it's hot. Yeah. I mean, I think I, – I believe that we might be doing something as a um, – more of an influencer style tournament as well. I think we're going to be doing in 2022 or later in 2021. Like this is a large more of this scale. stuff you're not supposed to talk yeah, about. Like a, yeah, just a large scale, not just like YouTubers, but like celebrities and baseball players. Make it fun, like really big, fun event. Wow. Wow. I look forward to your fun because your, your fun has <laughs> been a lot of fun. It's always fun to have you on here, Rob Turkula. Thank you for your big giant, you and your big giant set of balls for showing up here again this week. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. Thanks. So clearly Rob Turkula has the, maybe the second biggest set of balls in the internet. I mean, the Paul brothers, a little more risky than him. I mean, to throw it on the line with Floyd Mayweather, I don't know whether this is insane, whether this is the smartest thing ever, because you think about it, there's a lot to be gained. If you were to, I mean, he's not going to, but if he were to connect and knock out Floyd Mayweather, is it possible that somebody with th three fights becomes one of the best fighters of all time i i don't get it but do you know what you thought you were just tuning into a crappy little podcast but this podcast is about to continuously flex muscles not only did we have rob turkla but right now we're about to bring in our hollywood mma combat specialist 
Chris Van Vliet. I mean, before I bring him in, dude has won four Emmys. I mean, he's interviewed just about every Hollywood celebrity there is out there, including The Rock, which, I mean, and every wrestler there is out there. He's a huge pugilism nut like me. And 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 for free, he's agreed to be our, our combat sports Hollywood pugilism specialist. And without further ado, let's bring him in to talk about this crazy story with Floyd Mayweather and the Paul Brothers. CVV, Chris Van Bleet. All right, CVV, you have seen it. Everybody's seen it around the world. What, what, what is this shoot or work? You're right. Everybody's seen this. This is not real. This is not real life, what's going on here. But the thing that makes me scratch my head the most is what the hell is Jake Paul doing in this confrontation? He's not even the one in the fight. This is what's so confusing about it. This is Logan Paul's fight. Why is his brother stepping up to create this controversy here? It's just so very strange, but I will give you this. The Paul brothers, Jake and Logan, whichever one, are so good at creating controversy. And people want to watch these fights, not because Logan's a great boxer, not because Jake's a good boxer. Most people want to see these guys get their ass kicked. That's the main thing that, that comes out of this. 100%. Keep talking. You're the most professional looking and sounding guest that I've ever had. And the whole time <laughs> you've been talking, I've needed to cough. So talk away. Can you t- tell me how uh, tell me how smart those brothers are. You are you are the most professional looking and sound. I mean, all it takes is just having a microphone, right? All right, here I'm back. But now. Triller is doing some great stuff. Like whether you are, are shut up. What is great about that? That was I was so frustrated watching what tri- you thought that was great. Well, I think like that Mike Tyson fight was one of the highest purchased yes. pay-per-views in the history of pay-per-view. I will say this. We have to take Snoop Dogg off commentary. As much as we all love Snoop Dogg, it's it's got to go because how how can you even replay those highlights when Snoop Dogg's just yelling ridiculous things the whole time? I mean, the only person that made Snoop Dogg seem normal was Oscar De La Hoya. I mean, when they <laughs> when they let him on the microphone, you're just like, hey, you know what? Sometimes people should just be rich and, and go away. And and he did not. Uh, uh, now they were, t- they were talking about him fighting again. He's not going to fight, I guess, uh, post that, which isn't really a shocker, is it? No, that's not a shocker. And I think that a lot of people had forgotten Oscar De La Hoya was even relevant because I guess he really wasn't that relevant until he came back. I mean, look, that's, that does not take away from his incredible career in the ring. But yeah, I don't think that he needs to have a comeback. But I will say like, Triller could not have picked a better time to start creating these fights. Like COVID is the best possible time. We're all cooped up at home. We're all looking for something to watch, whether it's on Netflix or Hulu or pay-per-view. And the timing was perfect on this. And I think with the momentum that they're building here, when they start to have fans at these events, like these are going to be like just unbelievable like parties. This is going to be the thing where like everybody's going to want to be there. I agree. I mean, because the, and actually they make more sense when they have fans to me, because, you know, that's one of the things I think UFC fights have always figured out because you go to them and they have dead time. You know, it's not match after match, you know, it's not fight after fight. You, you have dead time where people socialize and, and, but Triller obviously has a lot more of that, but the Paul brothers, I agree. Geniuses. Um, I, I never got to meet them or anything. Uh, I mean, they, but would, if they'd want to be on either of our silly little podcasts, yeah, we'd gladly, please. gladly come have on. you. We would, we would come together to interview you. But two hours before all that stuff happened, Logan Paul was tweeting that the internet is boring and he's about <laughs> to fix it. Like, is he playing the world? Like, is he Geppetto? Yes, that, that is exactly, this is pro wrestling, but they're going to have boxing gloves on. That's exactly what this is. Everybody knows who's going to win this fight. Floyd Mayweather has never lost a boxing match. He's not going to lose to some YouTuber who hasn't even fought real boxers before. The crazy thing about all of this is we're all like invested in this. We're all enthralled trying to figure out what is going to happen here. We all know it's going to happen. We all know the ending. We just want to see how we get to that ending. And, I, and again, I go back to what I said earlier. People don't like the Paul brothers and they want to see someone like beat them up. And it's going to be Floyd Mayweather, as small as he is in comparison to Logan Paul, Floyd Mayweather is just going to hand his ass to him. Or, or you know, it's easy to say that, but 
is this not the most calculated? But let's just say it is a fight. There is anything can happen. We've seen that many, many times. But like if Logan Paul were to connect and, and I get it, I am a thousand percent behind you that Floyd Mayweather wins this. But is it not these who's making the bigger gamble right here? I mean, all of a sudden, Logan Paul throws his hat in the ring with the greatest fighters of all time if he beats Floyd Mayweather, regardless of his age. Well, Floyd Mayweather is the greatest defensive boxer of all time. Logan Paul is going to like, it's going to be so difficult for Logan Paul to try to land a shot. Look what Conor McGregor did. And Conor McGregor looked pretty good. Like he definitely held his own in that match against Floyd Mayweather. But, you know, he's still, he didn't stand a chance. And he's one of the greatest UFC fighters of all time. So Logan Paul, who again has never fought a real boxer, is going to go in there and lose. And then Jake Paul's been doing all this other stuff behind the scenes to try to, you know, try to really bring a buzz to his name. And then I'm sure Jake Paul is going to get a match with Floyd Mayweather, and the exact same thing's going to happen. Yeah, uh, you're probably right. You're probably right. Well, you're and, they, not- and they're laughing all the way to the bank, as they should be. I mean, there's got to be boxers and real fighters that have trained incredibly hard that are like, I, I can't, I can't get nothing. And this guy's got three fights. And he, he, I mean, the entire UFC fight was chanting Jake Paul's name. It really is the, I mean, it's one of the greatest hype jobs ever in the history of sports. It's, I mean, it's a brilliant pivot too. like to pivot from YouTube and social media to be able to go, yeah, kind of like this boxing thing. I'm pretty good at this boxing thing. Let's go after the biggest names in the sport and see if I can get in the ring with them. Oh, wait, I can? And they're just running with this. <laughs> really? 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 I, I mean, I would never bet that what they can't do because they, everything they've set out to do. I mean, the fact that these fighters are even humoring them blows me away. Well, but- they're humoring them because they go, hey, will you do this? Here is a large sum of money. Oh, that's not enough? Oh, here's even more money then. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like the exact opposite of when I call you up and say, hey, will you come on our, our little podcast? <laughs> I mean, very little money, very little hype or anything. But maybe, maybe some of our silly viewers will tune into your stuff. Where can they find you, Chris? I'm at Chris Van Vliet on all social media. And wherever you listen to this, you can find my podcast, Insight with Chris Van Vliet, where we reverse engineer the habits and techniques of people who are at the very top of their game. Kind of like you, Dave Mercer. Yeah, just exactly like me, Yeah, except a lot more shiny and polished. Chris Van Vliet, thank you very much. (laughs) So good to see you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. All of a sudden, I feel the need to speak a lot more professionally and present myself. I mean, that's why I don't hang out with CVV. I mean, that's why, I mean, even over Zoom, I'm intimidated by his professionalism. But thank you very much, CVV. We'll see him again. And the best thing about him, I mean, he looks polished and primmed and put together, but he is a fish-catching, wrestling-watching geek just like me. Um, and somehow we found each other, and I'm, I'm glad he found his way onto our silly little podcast. But our podcast has continued to charge up the ratchet pole of something or another so let's continue that climb here right now ladies and gentlemen last week we proved to have international appeal with our canadian guests now we're going to stretch out even more internationally and bring in the only australian to ever qualify for the bassmaster elite series the only australian to ever win a bassmaster elite series event from toowoomba how much fun is that to say toowoomba australia hear my heart Carl Jacobson. Carl Jacobson, thank you for doing this. Uh, what, what, what are you up to today? Um, just got back from Nashville, immigration uh, and uh, citizenship up there. So I had our, had our final interview for my green card into the US. So it's um, feeling, feeling really good because it all is finally sort of coming to an end after almost 10 years of going through it all. So. <laughs> It really has been like when you say 10 years, people assume in their head, they think, oh, he's just been waiting for 10 years because you got to wait. But you've literally this has been a nonstop work for you, not just to make it here, but but to stay here and be able to follow your dream. Yeah, no, it's it has been nonstop, you know, nonstop paperwork, money. You know, it's uh, uh, 
we've spent over over thirty thousand dollars now to live here legally and earn money um, for the past nine years. Like that's how much it's cost in government and attorney fees. And that's flying back and forward to Australia, going to the US Embassy in Sydney and Australia, interviews. I've had three three year um, O one sporting visas, and I've had a one year one, and then now it's rolling over into a green card. And it's been a it's been a journey, and I hate paperwork and stuff like that. And we printed out three hundred and fifty pages yesterday, and I mean we just got stacks of stuff. We've had affidavits from family members and photos from holidays. We've got to prove a lot of stuff through Kayla and I getting married. And, uh, and, and then, yeah, it was, you, you watched the movie, the proposal. That's what we thought the interview was going to be like today. (laughs) And, uh, it was pretty hectic. Like there wasn't any smiles or laughs. The lady was, uh, was very serious and had me and Kayla in there. And sometimes they separate you, but she had to ask me what Kayla's birthday was. And, and, uh, and I would so fail that. And I've been married for (laughs) almost 20 years. Yeah, they were simple questions, but like she would stunt you with a couple. Like I needed, it. I needed to have everything lined up, but we both passed uh, pretty easily, so it went well. Well, Australians and Aussies have proved one thing: uh, it, it, you are a relentless group of people that never stop fighting for what you want. You have proved that with your with your motto for my heart. But yep. we learn it every single time you're on live, and I kind of joke about it. You break the internet, but. It, w- with the amount of comments and the amount of things that we've seen over the years, just the following, what, what is it really like in Australia? Like, is it just a dozen really drunk, really loud guys that, <laughs> that, that have made a ruckus on the internet or what is it? The truth. It's uh, it's been really cool. So it's the, you know, it was very small, you know, hardly anything with me growing up, like the tournaments were, a handful of people, 30 to 50 boats. It grew to about 80 boats. And I had like, well, there wasn't really that much social media even till I moved over here. Like I didn't have Facebook, that, so it didn't spread that yeah. much. But I was actually worried. I'd competed in Australia, worked full-time tackle store, I'd been, and I've done a lot there, D- DVDs and TV and AFC. You, that's how you knew me yeah. through AFC. I competed, you know, on a big na- sort of a national level in Australia. We had helicopters and bass boats. It's it was, really cool. It was cool. And um, so I got a, bi- a pretty decent name in Australia in the fishing industry. Um, but then when I moved to America, I thought, man, I just did all of that. I'm 26 years old. And I'm going to lose all of that and like start from scratch. And what I didn't know what was going to happen is it tenfolded. When I came over here, it was like Australia got on my back and pushed me, you know, like, and so we love like the Aussie digger spirit. Like we're we're sort of the underdogs. We've always been the underdogs. Just we have less people, less, just we don't have all the resources, but we've got that heart. That's where it comes from. And, And through the overseas fighting and everything Australia has had that Anzac spirit that heart where we just fight to the very end and I'm, I I got some of that but we also back our own just like everyone does in their country so they love to see an Aussie coming to America because it's actually quite rare you know there's a handful of people that have done it and then actually been successful and uh it was so it was cool to see that my support grow and then now it's like it's it's pretty special. Like when I catch a fish and I know I'm on live and the Aussies are watching their hair stand up on the back of your neck and you get those goosebumps. Cause you just know like how fired up they're getting for it. Is it, is it kind of strange in the way that, you know, in a Canadian way, it feels like a lot of times Canadians haven't made it. If they've made it in Canada, that's cool and all that's good for them. But, but yeah. they really haven't made it until they make it in the States or, or outside of the outside of Canada. And he was, is Australia yeah. like that? It's exactly the same. It's identical. So if you can be, if you're the best golfer in the world and you stay in Australia, you'll probably work at the local golf shop and (laughs) do training and then beat everyone on the weekends and travel. But you just, until you make that jump and come to America, you're just not going to go to that next level. And we have golf, we have really good golfers, um, motocross riders um, that have come, Chad Reed and some of those big guys. Um, we have really good bull riders, so they come over and try and make it on the PBR circuit. Um, so 
the biggest one that's been tough is football. We have like phenomenal kickers and rugby players and we're tough and fast, but, and, and, but when they, ca- they try and come and make it in U.S. football, we've had one Jared Hayne, a guy that he made it and he actually made it to the San Francisco 49ers. And, like, he never dropped a ball in his whole life. Like, he's a freak. Like, just if he gets it kicked to him in a fullback, he's catching every time. And now he got called in and played and he dropped the first two balls and he went back to Australia. And so yeah. it was like super like it's, it's cutthroat and it shows like how hard and how, and, and how little he looked compared to like the Americans. It was crazy. Like just how everything's just so amplified here and bigger. And when you get here, it's just for an Aussie, it's mind blowing, but it's also like whatever you're into, this is like dreamland for whatever you're into. You come to America and what you love is tenfold bigger and, and better than what you've ever seen it. Yeah, it's what you, what you grow up seeing your whole life, I would yeah. imagine. You but, watch but, it on TV. Yep. But it's not just the uh, Americans that impress the Australians. There's things that the Australians do that, 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 that both confuse, impress, insult, um, infuriate in some situations, Americans. And, and one of those is lingos. And I didn't even think of it as a thing uh, until the first time Carl Jacobson, this young Australian pro, threatened in a Bassmaster event and and there is a particular word they use in Australia and it's a term of endearment in in, yeah. in America, North America I will say, <laughs> include Canada in the, in the group there and I will say it is probably the most offensive word for a, a lady's most private of parts, let's just call it the, the, the stunt word let's say, the stunt word is not a nice thing in North America, but if you are a mad stunt or uh, my favorite stunt in Australia, it's okay. Talk to me about that. Yeah, I think it's just a part of our, it's the Aussie, Aussie lingo, Aussie language. It's what, I don't know, I don't know where or how it come from, but it's just not offensive. Any, we call a swear word in Australia is just not offensive. It's just purely a part of the language. Um, but it depends how they say it, and, and but everyone says it. Everyone says every word in Australia. It's very rare to find someone that doesn't swear in Australia, and uh, it's just it's it's almost just a part of every single sentence. But it's uh, it's definitely not offensive, and it's funny when you hear someone else say it from over here or say words. It sounds offensive when an Aussie does it. You're like, did he just say that? <laughs> but it's uh, true. You're yeah, right. Like, it doesn't. It just, it just rolled off. I was worried because Kayla's family, like on her two sides with the um, wedding, is like you know they're they're great and they they you know they're not uptight or anything like that. But when you put 32 Australians in Idaho called Lane in a really nice wedding situation. <laughs> you know, th- things get th- in a few beers, things get said, um, but everyone just laughs and loves it. It's they, they realize it's just part of almost the culture. I guess what probably made it more shocking to people is it wasn't listening to someone say it. It was like in comments, you know, people were yeah. just where somebody would. <laughs> You know, go yeah. so and so go. <laughs> the, the the Australians <laughs> said it in a in a different yeah. different way. Is there other words like that that I'm not unaware of? Uh yeah, well just just lingo words and stuff and Kayla's are what we're always picking up on different stuff, but that's definitely the one that like shocks most of the world, except for anyone in Australia, like you know, I'm, sh- I'm sure my mum's called me that a-, a handful of times and <laughs> it just rolled off perfectly and I knew whether it was good or bad <laughs> if I was in trouble or not. Uh, That's yeah. just how, how Australians roll. <laughs> it's what you get used to, I guess. I mean, yeah. I-, I can feel your pain a little bit because growing up, I mean, I was born in Ireland, which you know, uh, a lot yeah. of people listening to this may not know, and I lived in Belfast until... You know, I was five, but my mom was Catholic and my dad was Protestant. And I always say that made me Canadian. But one of the things that came over from Ireland is one of the terms that they use in Ireland for a good time or for a joke or we had a laugh last night is the word crack. So yeah. I had friends over. I remember in high school and my mom came back from some function the night before. And, she, and I'm like, how was it last night? And she's like, son, it was the crack was great. And my <laughs> friends were pretty appalled by that so yeah 
No, you there's definitely borders exist. I have to. Um, I've been good to where I haven't. I don't think I've lost my accent. Like I go to Australia and and no one gives me a hard time, and I've had to make sure I don't because my mates would give me hell if I lost my accent. But what I've found is like if I use my pure Aussie lingo, like most Americans don't even understand it. Like if I start, and I'm noticing now I'm even talking faster to you because I don't know. It's just, it, it's, you, you change, you can, you t- some people. I'm like that too. My voice, yeah, she, pick, my wife can tell when up. I'm on the phone with Overstreet without yeah. knowing, like, she's just like, you're talking like, it's weird. It's weird. Yeah, like the- I, I, I've picked up to where I know, like if I say, I'm going to go down to the servo and grab some fuel or grab some, yeah, fuel or petrol. Like they're going to say, what are you going to do? You know, and I'm, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to go to the gas station or I'm not going to call it servo or use all that lingo. But I noticed when I go home to Australia for like a month, when I was able to do that, when I would come back, like no one would understand me for the first like couple months. And then I would get back into it again. The, the, can we just for fun moving forward every yeah. single time we talk on the stage? Can you go straight Aussie from now on? I want to just hear <laughs> yeah. petrol from yeah. the servo. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm I tired of hearing nobody's yeah. <laughs> outboard burns any gas. So it'd be more entertaining to hear about your we'll petrol go, consumption. We'll go full. We'll go full lingo. We'll go full Aussie. Not full Aussie. If you go full Aussie, it might <laughs> go real bad. Just don't want to drop a stunt a word out there <laughs> no, on stage. No, no. Not, never go full Aussie on stage. <laughs> never full Aussie. <laughs> no, never go full Aussie. <laughs> never go full Aussie, but a little bit of Aussie is yeah. just fine. Carl yeah. Jacobson, thank you very much. Cheers, mate. I may never, ever look at a stunt car driver ever the same. Thankfully, me and Carl Jacobson were able to speak the international language of angling. And I thank you for listening to our silly little chats. And I've done my part of this transaction. Now it's time for you to do yours. And that's the part where I have to beg you real quickly to like, comment, subscribe, review, rate, teach the algorithms of the, algorithms of the world that we exist. And, and, and I will find... Three, four, two, one, who knows? Somebody's to call next week and it, it will be awkward and they will be angling and it, it'll be conversations. And and my name will still be Mercer. I hope you are tuned in. A little week on the end, guys, huh? Boom shakalaka? <laughs> That'll help. That makes people happy when I say that. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear? Hey, 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 wait, wait, wait. If you're still here, I, I, I mean, I hate doing that part where I got to beg you to subscribe and like and comment and stuff, but it really does make a difference. I know it seems like it's petty and stupid. And why would people be rated on the fact that like if somebody sat around and watched an entire video for a whole long time and really enjoyed it, you would probably just assume they liked it. But no, no, that's not how this works. You got to touch the thumbs up button so please do that and that, that one day one day they promise me that we'll get enough subscribers and enough viewers that i won't have to do this anymore okay so help me out see you guys see you next week <laughs>